thing I'm going to come. Hi everyone, how are you this evening? Happy New Year. I hope you're all well. Um, I'm just going to move this here out the way for me. Um, what you should be able to do is you should be able to see on your screen me um, and also um, a presentation with a holding slide at the moment which says uh, personal and team resilience. Um, so you'll see that um, I'm on there and my name is Susie Edwards. Um, can I just explain a little bit about how the webinar will work? Um, there is some participation required from yourselves, so I'm sure you won't mind, but we will do a few polls um, in this uh, session. And what will happen is, um, as we go through the presentation, um, I'll move us through, and there'll be one part of it where you'll see that there's kind of a, a lot of hands up. And then at that point, um, you'll know that I'm about to ask you to, to participate in a poll. And when that happens, I'll then launch the poll and then you you then click and answer it. So it's really easy to do, but it's just um, the polls really help us to just get a sense of understanding more about where you are in this topic area and just specific um, elements around that. So um, this is the first one of the year on this topic. We have another one later this month on career planning and then they happen on a monthly basis. So um, you can get a real sense of um, each of those um, sessions as we go throughout the year. Now, this session in particular, um, we thought would be really relevant. I mean, if you think about kind of winter and everything that's going on and thinking about the workplace at the moment, it's a, it's a really interesting subject area to discuss. And so um, we thought that we kickstart the year with this topic area. We also have alongside the webinars, some of you will know this already, but just in case you don't, we also have alongside it um, a range of e-learning modules. So if you feel after this that you want to do something else a little bit more um, further in depth or read around the topic area in more detail, then you can access that through BMJ Learning. And so you can type in Understanding Resilience in Healthcare and that will bring it um, straight up for you. And the other thing that we do throughout the course of the year is that we run a series of masterclasses. Um, and the first masterclass of the year happens this coming March. Um, and I think bookings for that happen at, towards the end of January, beginning of Feb, just to let you know um, what's going on. So what I thought I'd do um, is I'll just bring up one of the first slides. You may see me having to click on to go next to make it go live. And I'm just going to make sure that you can see everything as we go. Um, and the presentation is there with you now. So we're just getting ready to start it now. Um, and then I'm just going to click through now to the first slide that you can see. Um, and throughout it, you may find that I have to click on and you'll see my little um, arrow so that I can move through as well. So in this session, I want to try and cover three key areas if I can with you. And those are um, looking at resilience, and I'm really interested in looking at it both from an individual or personal perspective, but also maybe thinking about how you currently work within your teams. Um, and I use the word plural there for a reason, and also thinking about how it might um, interact in terms of resilience within an organizational setting. Um, interestingly, there are kind of some areas of resilience that I thought would be useful to share, and there are kind of five key areas that we'll look at. Um, I will bring in some research and theory and embed that into practice, but I'm hopeful that some of the techniques, thoughts and approaches that we'll discuss and use um, this evening, some of them you'll think actually I could use that embed it into um, my practice. Um, and some of them you'll think actually that probably doesn't suit me um, and I will take that bit and then maybe move it into something else. So that's the kind of shape of how um, I'll run the session itself. In terms of timing, I'm expecting it to run between 45 to 50 minutes in duration. So just so that you know where we are with the timing as well. Um, and uh, afterwards, one of the things that you get after the session is you get a certificate of attendance, just so that we've covered all that part off, just so that you know uh, where we are with it all. Um, so one of the first things I'm going to do is because I can't, I don't know exactly who's here. I know how many people are attending, but I don't know your background. I'm just going to launch one of the first polls um, of the day. And so the, the poll itself, so what you'll find is that you will have on your screen in a moment, just bear with me a second, I'm just going to launch it. I'm just going to select that poll, which says who's with us today. And then I'm going to launch that. So you'll see on your screen now, 
a question that the polls open at the moment so you'll see who is with us today and then there's just a series of different um, options to choose from um, and um, there's a mixture you know so what I'm going to get at the moment is I'll be able to see how many of you have voted so I get a sense of the percentage of that so that's what I'm just waiting on at the moment so it's just good for me to know who's here and the backgrounds of people because that really can help me also think about how I, I, I present the session as well. Um, so what I've got at the moment is I've got almost all of you have voted. So I'm just going to um, close the poll now. And then what you'll then see are the responses of what other people have um, said as well. So one of the things that will happen is I'll share it with you. So what you're going to find now is that I'm just going to close that poll. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to close it. And then what you'll then see is I'll share those results. So what you'll be able to see now is you can see that within the within the room this evening, we've got 43% um, uh, consultants asked. We've got um, GPs, 14%, no medical students. And then we've got a mix of, of, of others. Now, they may also, um, so thank you to all for doing that. It's just good for me to know the mix of um, roughly of stages that you're in because the, um, one of the things that's really interesting about um, thinking about healthcare is that depending on what stage you're at, the experiences that you all have, you will bring um, a real rich, richness to this. But also there'll be certain experiences that you have based on um, your own um, stage in your career and where you're at that will add to this as well. So your experiences will really help. So thank you so much for doing that. What I'm going to do now is, is close that off now. And then what we should be able to do is to move on. So the other thing that before we get going, I wanted to just check with you. So I just have to move it again. Bear with me, everyone, just with that. So I hope you don't mind. But the other thing I just want to get a sense of as we get going is just understanding in the context of your resilience. Now, we're doing this at the end of a day. So um, potentially, or you may well be starting on depending on what your um, schedules are like. But it's good for me to understand about your level of resilience. So I'm also going to bring up another poll now just to get a sense of that together. So what we'll, what we'll see here is I'm just going to bring up another poll here. So we'll just bring that up now. And then I can see this one here. So it's just going to launch now. So you should be able to see it. So when you see this here, it'll say, how resilient do you feel at the moment? And then I'll have on it kind of on a scale of um, one to five. So you'll see that there's um, an option there um, that you can do with one being low, five being high. There's nothing really there. So um, great. I just need to just hold on for a moment. Just there's half of you have voted so far. So again, I, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and if this is the first time you're doing a webinar like this, you're all doing it really well. So, um, so what, so what I'm, ex so what I was really expecting in terms of the curve, and this will not necessarily be a surprise to everyone, is I'm not really necessarily expecting anyone to sort of openly do do five. Um, uh, but actually, interesting if we look at that in terms of the share, which I'm going to just do now. I'm going to close it. And just share it with you all what you'll see is that just to make sure that that's gone for you now can you see it there we go i think you can all see it now um so what you'll see on the screen now is that um between two and two and five that's where you're all sitting in terms of the curve um but interestingly there you've got if you look at point two, two and three so you've got a, a reasonable majority you've got half there at that lower end and then there's half of you who are that who are actually okay um and one of the things that i'm going to say about about resilience um is that resilience is very much on it's on a continuum how you feel today may be very different from how you feel tomorrow in a week in the next month and working in healthcare. As you all know, it's really not the same as working in any many other professions. Pressure really can be felt at all corners of the organization, whether that be financial, structural, or an increase in impact in the workload and the demands that that, that has on you. And this can really take its toll both physically and emotionally. So one of the things that we're gonna look at is that within yourself, all of you will have a different point within a continuum. If we had a line here, and um, you'll all have different points in the journey where, where that's the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close the poll now um, and just bring up here. So we're back on the screen here and you can now see all of you. Now, I have a mad passion for running. Um, that's not the reason why I've necessarily put it up here. But just what I wanted to try and get at was that 
sometimes we can see the road ahead and with this one we've within the kind of idea of resilience and around thinking about where we are with it is that we can very clearly see ourselves on that road and we know actually in terms of our levels of resilience we we are able to to keep going um and and make uh significant sort of impact in our work but there are other days where we just can't get those trainers on we just can't put them on we cannot get out the door because actually it's not just a straightforward one of the things about resilience is that it's not it's a word that when you think about it uh, over time it it is sometimes something that's kind of overused and this is my own personal view at the moment so one of the things that you can find is as a consequence of saying you need to be more resilient my question really is in what context how how do you actually do that and with the actual phraseology of the word resilience when people it's used out of context it can really diminish its significance and meaning and many of you will know what the actual latin or the derivation of resilience because people often talk about it in this idea of to jump again or to bounce back um but one of the things with that i have with that is that it's not as straightforward as that you can't just bounce back from a very difficult situation that you've been in and i think that for me one of the things that i want to have a look at and, and think about around the research is just it's just trying to look at resilience from a few different perspectives and just getting us to think about the fact that Although we might start from a different position, we all have an ability to actually become more resilient. Um, some of the research that's been taking place over the last, I think it's over the last 40 years or so, combination by psychologists, by clinicians, um, some of the more famous ones that you may or may not have heard of, but there's um, Norman Garmisi, there's Emmy Werner, there's Martin Sleekman, which some of you are in positive psychology in that, in that regard. One of the things that they all kind of talk about in terms of a common theme is that when you look at re resilience, um, if you can try and think of it not necessarily as a trait that people have or they don't have, like you need to become more resilient or you, you've got that or you haven't, one of the things that they really sort of look at and actually sort of start to delve into in more detail is that with the concept of resilience, it really is comprised of an individual's behaviour, thoughts and actions. And I think one of the things that we can really do in this space is that we can start to think about small steps that we can bring into our practice to try and help us to become more resilient, but also for us to be mindful that we all start off from different standpoints with that. So one of the things that you may well see is that you may well know of people who always seem to come across as being, in your mind, very resilient. And you're thinking, how do they manage to keep on going? And keep on coming back from that um, and you may well think actually I'm, I'm here on that so when we did the the poll in terms of your resilience you're you're at two so it's really not it's not great but you want to try and move it forward and you want to just try and move it there and one of the things with resilience is that it's something that we continue to do throughout the course of our life it's it's a lifelong it's a lifelong skill it's not something that we just have and it's there we have to keep on on building it and with quite a lot of the work that I do in, in trust. Um, one of the things that we can see is depending on kind of the department, the pace, the environment that you're in, it has a massive impact on, on our ability to be resilient. I'm just going to move um, off this slide now um, and on to um, um, a, a definition really of resilience, which you can just see up on the screen um, at the moment. So you can see there that it's defined as your ability to succeed personally. I don't need to read it, you can, you can read it yourself. But one of the things that I think is important about, about resilience is this, this combination about thinking about high pressure, fast moving and continually changing. Because one of, each of these three aspects are things that you, you experience all on a day-to-day -day basis. Because the, the fact that you're working in environments where you're ultimately saving lives and as a consequence of that, um, the pressure that you have, and that's not just the kind of emotional, it's a physical pressure in terms of what you do, it, it does have an impact on, on your ability to maintain a level of resilience. And so um, I wanted to kind of show you, there's been a little bit of research that's been carried out, well, I don't say that, so it's been carried out in Sweden looking at children. And I 
I thought it's really interesting to think about our learned behaviours when we're younger and actually how that kind of impacts on our self-belief in terms of how resilient we may well be. Um, and I'm going to bring something up now which has got um, a couple of pictures of some plants. Um, and one of those, I'll just bring them up now, you can see that there's a dandelion and then you'll also see on the screen that there's an orchid. So you'll see that there's, um, there's a combination of two things here. So um, in, in Sweden, um, there was some research that's been carried out over a number of years where they've really looked into resilience in childhood. Um, and they've been looking at the fragility of situations that people have and um, characteristics within that early stage of childhood. Now, many, if any of you are working with children, which many of you will be, be doing, one of the things that you will um, encounter um, time and time again is, is that you will see with children that they do seem to have this, some of them seem to have this ability to be able to be um, effectively coming back from all series of types of traumas and really horrendous situations. And that level of resilience that they have seems to be really strong. And one of the things that they um, were looking at was they were looking at the, um, the way of the, the brain functions and looking at um, the innate um, ability to um, be resilient. Um, I'm just noticing on my screen, and I just want to make sure that you can all hear me okay, because one of the things that's just happening at the moment is I'm getting a note on my computer to say um, that I've got um, an audio quality in the recording. So I'm, I'm connected into the main, it's come, yeah, so what I'll just do is that when I, if I see that coming up on the screen again, I may well just put my hand up to just say I'm just going to check, and then I'll resume where I was, yeah, so that no one misses anything. Um, I'm connected into the main system, so there shouldn't really be um, any issue. I'm not on Wi-Fi, actually, so um, apologies for that if you heard. So let me just go back for a moment. All I was, what I was just trying to say there was what some of the research looked into was that they, they looked into the brain's um, innate neuroplasticity and how it enables us to develop a unique barrier of almost like psych psychological Teflon that can help us to handle particular types of setbacks. Now, I'm about to describe things as plants, which I don't necessarily mean that we are plants, but I'm just using these as an analogy when I sort of talk about this for a moment. And so one of the things that if you think about it, I've got two things up there on the screen. I've got a dandelion and an orchid. And so, so you can see them, they're, they're there, they're in front of us. But one of the things that's interesting about a dandelion is that if you stand on a dandelion, what happens? So I'm standing on that dandelion, it springs back up. It just has that ability to um, come back. And I'm not necessarily talking about this ability to bounce back, but it does seem to be able to, it grows everywhere. Um, it has, uh, it, some people would say it's not a weed, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, flower, um, but it does have an ability to keep coming back. Whereas one of the things that's interesting about orchids in, rela in, in relation to fragility is that orchids are delicate and they are, um, and you can sort of tell at times that if you were to kind of press on it, you'd break it. And so one of the things that why putting it, I was putting up plants here, I'm not suggesting that we are plants, but one of the things that's interesting about using plants is that um, we will have aspects in our personality and our behavior where depending on the situation that we're in, the people that we're with, the environment that we're in, we're able to manage a bit like a dandelion. And then there'll be other situations where we actually feel a bit more like an orchid within that. And it doesn't necessarily need to always be within the workplace. We may well find that as we, our resilience levels are different depending on where we are at that moment in time. So um, one of the things that um, horticulturists do, in, again, just to sort of just close this part off, but when they're preparing plants to move from the hothouse, one of the things that they do is they kind of expose them to increasingly varied changes in temperature. And as a consequence of that, it helps them to grow more resilient by exposing them to those changes. And then when they're, when they're able to kind of thrive in that natural climate beyond the hothouse walls, as it were, then effectively they're able to become more resilient due to that exposure. And I think one of the things that's really complex about, about us as humans is obviously we, we, don't, we have so many things that impact on our ability to be resilient, but we can, we can become more resilient over time. 
Um, and I wanted to show you this on the screen now, which is um, it's a quote from um, from a doctor um, from the King's Fund from some work that's been done by Prof. Um, Prof. Maven. Um, but one of the things that you'll see here on the screen is it's sort of saying here that everyone will say that you need to be good at communicating, you need to be good at basic science. But one of the things that I think you need is resilience because you work in a job that can sometimes knock you down and you just have got to brush yourself off, pick yourself up, say that was bad, that was awful, but here we go again. Now, that may not resonate with, with, with you or it may completely resonate with you because everyone's specialty and area will be different. But one of the things that really struck me about this was I was doing some work within um, P, um, PQ, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, and we started to sort of think about this kind of concept of um, the idea that when you're in a situation with an individual who may well be with the patient or with the family, the experience that you have at that moment is potentially that first time that they might have seen you, or in that moment, you then have, within a period of half an hour, someone else that you need to go to and another person. And each iteration that you have with that group of people, it's that first experience that they have with you. And you have to, in a way, which is why I totally get this idea of brushing yourself, like almost brushing yourself off, is that that experience that you had that with that person, that group, you have to kind of move that away and kind of almost have it away and then go on to the next one. Which, you know, if you're doing that time and time again throughout the course of your day, depending on what type of work, acute um, or not you're doing with your clinic, however you might be working, you will find that there is that real kind of emotional as well as physical impact on an individual's health and well-being, which is why some of you may well feel that actually you're on that lower level of the resilience when you were thinking about it yourself. And for me, that's also a really important area to look at is that one of the things that we need to consider is that if you kind of neglect that aspect of your kind of health and well-being, where if you kind of keep putting it to one side and, you, and you're not having an ability to talk about it, to debrief, to think about it, then one of the things that can happen is that you can have that kind of bottle effect where it can lead to stress and, and you know, for some people, for burnout, which we don't want. But you do need to have that kind of support, both from a kind of individual team and organizational level. There has been some recent research um, on looking at organizational resilience. Organizational resilience is still a growth area. There's been quite a lot done on the individual and team, but as an organizational aspect, um, the research that's looked at there is looking at the benefits of concentrating on resilience and actually how important it is when you're thinking about the work that you do with patients. And three things have really come out um, with that at the moment. It's looking at improved productivity, um, uh, increased well-being um, across all multi-professional uh, teams and also a really interesting one where um, there's a reduced uh, rate of absenteeism. So there's something really interesting about resilience both in, in, in different levels within the organisation. Um, what I want to spend a little bit of time looking at is that when we actually think about understanding resilience and thinking about it from a personal and as I move on to team perspective, there's a few things here that I just want to go into a little bit of detail of, if I may. Um, and I'm just going to go from developing right the way through to realistic optimism. Um, what I will do when I get to the second part of identifying emotion, I'll click on to a slide and then I'll come back to this one. Um, so you'll see me um, going back to this um, slide again. But one of the things that's really important in terms of thinking about the five aspects that you have within resilience, and these are in no particular order either, each of them needs to be there. But one of the first things that's really important is understanding and thinking about developing your personal vision, like yourself. Now that sounds a bit, um, I don't mean that to sound for long, but it's looking at two key things. Within, within your personal vision and values, if you think about those in relation to yourself, in terms of happiness, there are actually six key things that we kind of need um, in order for us to be thinking about our happiness, which links into our ability to be resilient. And that is around where we are going within that. So if we think about it, it's important to think about the people that we work with and how important are they in terms of our ability to, to be resilient or not, you know, what the impact is, the action environment that we're in and how the pace, the variety, the noise, the levels that we've got in there, what impact that has in us and how important it is. For some people, it's very important that the environment, for example, that they're near windows. For other people, it doesn't matter or for the environment, they need to be on the go, they don't want to be by a desk. The environments can be very important for others, 
not for, not for other people. So there's those two aspects there. Then there are things which are the work-life balance. And actually, when you're sort of thinking about your resilience level, if workload and demands are increasing and you're not able to leave and you've got things that you need to go to, you can sustain that for a certain period of time. But beyond that, you know, it can get, you know, you can find that actually that's been compromised. And if that's out of synchronization over a long period of time, you, your resilience levels diminish. The other things are around how your location of where you're based for your work. So depending on what career stage you're at, that's why I was interested for some people who are junior doctors, they may well be based in one area, then moving. Um, and then for um, SAS or consultants, you may well be in a one particular place throughout the, the next uh, few years. But in terms of where you are, that location of how you get there, what you do on the way to work, how you take time out to help from yourself is important to consider. And then the other thing is about value in terms of financial value. So the other thing around this area, which is interesting, is around um, financial aspects of it. And then it only gets to how you actually work and what you do. So around that aspect, there's something about the values of what's important to you um, relating to your happiness. And the other thing that's that, that links to that is thinking about your common purpose. So I can pose a question to you, but I mean, um, in terms of thinking about it, but one of the things to maybe think about, which maybe is a good time to do at the start of a new year, is to kind of understand what may, just to re go back to what motivates you to get up in the morning and do what you do. Because one of the things that can happen is that you go, you, you're going in your, on your kind of treadmill of what you're doing and you haven't had a chance to just take that step back and actually think, what is, what am I doing, you know, thinking about what that's for. Because actually what that can do is that if you have that there and you know why, it can actually help you, particularly in situations where resilience levels are, have diminished, like you can, you can kind of revisit that and say, actually, this is why I do what I do. I know what I'm doing it and what for. And I think that that's going to be really, really important around thinking about resilience. That's one aspect, which is around that understanding what you're doing, why you're doing it, and also inspiring and bringing people with you around the common purpose of what you're all doing together. And that common purpose can be around the team that you're in and also ultimately within the organisation that you're working in. Um, the second area is looking at identifying emotions. Now, emotions to me are extremely interesting because... One of the things about emotions is that how we manage them, we're all completely different. Um, and the triggers that we have in terms of our stress triggers around emotion will vary. Um, I had an interesting experience when um, I was talking about this um, in a session, um, in a face-to-face -face one, and someone mentioned something really powerful, which was that one of the things that they do, they, they have what they would call um, their, their protective armor, so when they're thinking about situations, and that protective armor is um, is actually their, their their uniform, what they wear. And so one of the things they were talking about in that example, and it um, was that they were they, they felt that they were able to kind of separate themselves from the emotion that they were in to help them with their resilience levels by kind of almost having a kind of protective layer in some way. And I found that quite interesting to think about because the protective layer that we all have. Um, in medicine, on the whole, people will te tend to wear something that's different from what they wear outside of their work. So when they're actually in the zone in terms of resilience levels, they actually have, if you were having a different role, you've got your role that you have in work, and then you have your role and your other wear that you wear out with. But the other thing that can happen with emotions, and this is where I'm going to bring something up now, is that there's a particular technique which is uh, linked into positive psychology, which is linked into the ability to be more resilient, which looks at um, a piece of work called the ABC. And I'm just going to bring it up now on the screen. And it's something which is called um, looking at how we use our internal thoughts and actually how we can think differently about a situation around emotion. Because often within resilience, one of the things that can happen is our our emotional level to a situation has an impact on our ability to be resilient. I think that's obvious. I don't need to go into that. But what this technique gets you to kind of do and to think about is with a particular situation that you had. Now, it can be something that you can reflect on after this if you want to, and it can go into um, your portfolio or just use it for just now and just think about it something for the future. But where you've had a situation where actually there's been a situation which um, you haven't necessarily been happy with you found it very emotional and you thought actually I kind of could have done with managing that better and um, it's quite straightforward it gets you to think about doing um 
the who, what, why, where, when. But that part of it, it that part there is straightforward. But the next part is, uh, is thinking about your own beliefs. Like, if you can try and think about, well, what were you actually saying to yourself during that? So you can sort of say, well, what was going through your head? So understanding about a particular situation. So if some, if you were in a meeting, for example, and someone had said something where they were actually critiquing you um, in a way about a patient which you actually di you, you didn't necessarily agree with, but you didn't feel that you were able to necessarily assert yourself in that because there was too many other people there then one of the things that you could sort of think about well what you know within within my head what was what was I thinking about there I should have done more of this did I have a bit of an inner critic happening here where um, I didn't feel able to kind of necessarily communicate my thoughts um, and one of the things that you can use with this technique so it's called how you reframe um, a situation to help to improve your emotion and so one of the things that you can then look at around beliefs is thinking about your consequences of that so Afterwards, we'll say, well, actually, what would have happened in, in this situation? And actually, what would have been the worst case scenario for that? So within this um, area of looking at the ABC, you describe a recent event and you can do it in your head or write it down. You can think about, well, what am I actually saying to myself? What's going through my head? What are the consequences of the way that I'm thinking? And is there anything within that that actually is inaccurate? Do I have the right evidence about this? Am I putting it into perspective correctly? Have I actually thought, is it in my head or is it a reality of what's happening here? Because when we're looking at our emotions around this, and, and particularly this one can be quite useful when we're reframing where we're trying to build resilience when we're working with other colleagues, peer to peer, um, uh, junior to senior and vice versa, just making sure that we've really thought about it. And the other part which we often find around emotion and again, you'll have your experience of this as well. You will know where you have your peak energy levels, whether that be the start, middle or end of the day. But actually, your energy, the way, the, the way that your energy is and how you feel also has a massive impact on your ability to think about being resilient. So it's just really interesting to think about what your mood was like, your behavior. And so thinking about how you re reframe that differently. Um, this technique works really well and has worked in practice well. So it's just something to think about. If emotions where you can feel that you've got a build up of it and you want to just think about actually reflecting and, and, and analyzing that yourself and just understanding a bit more about what you do. And then one of the things with the dispute where you can kind of um, think about the inaccuracies is, is thinking about what you might do um, differently or how you can change your perspective on that and thinking about the other side. So there's just something useful in that to just to, to um, think through. Um, the other area on embracing change is that um, there, there's a really interesting book called The Re Resiliency, Resiliency Advantage. And one of the things that they kind of look at within that is um, how we think about change. One of the things within the NHS that you will all be used to is that change is sort of inevitable. Um, there's, um, you've got macroeconomic factors that have massive impact on your ability to do things which are out of your control. And then you have other things that happen within a change setting, whether that be role, whether that be team, whether it be the actual function of what you do, the technology that you have, the systems that you're in, the processes that are there, where it all has a, a knock-on effect on change. Um, but one of the things that's interesting to think about is to just ask yourself the question about you, how happy you are with change. So within change, if you're um, really happy to kind of go with the flow with change and it doesn't really bother you too much and you feel quite um, resilient around that, People who tend to have that kind of level in terms of where you, they might place themselves, they're usually quite flexible and can adapt quite well to change. So in terms of thinking about that side of resilience, it isn't necessarily problematic to them. But for other people who may not find that as easy, it can have a big impact on how we think about how we manage and deal with change. So one of the things that's really important that's linked to that is really thinking about the support structures that you have, um, within your place of work that can kind of help you to think about not just change but thinking about the emotional side and also thinking about your value which is around the support side so um, again I don't know necessarily where you're all based but there has been so some places are using um, um, a valiant approach to thinking about support where which is more clinical based which some of you may well have experienced where people are have an ability to come together and um, it's a psychological, sorry, a psychological background, but you're able to then talk through um, and think about particular issues um, using um, the Valiant technique. There is another one which is um, which is growing as well within a number of hospital settings, not necessarily so much in GP settings, 
um, but within uh, hospital settings, which is looking at um, Schwartz rounds. Um, and one of the things that's happening there, so originally from America, um, came into the UK over the last few, few years. Um, but one of the things that it looks at is that it will bring a particular situation or kind of case where um, all multi-professional teams will come together, usually at lunchtime, and there'll be a subject area that's talked around that. So you get a sense of understanding a particular situation from a, from a variety of viewpoints, which is really interesting. And then starting to think about from um, everyone within the team, actually what kind of support can be there. So it's not purely clinical, but it has clinical and non-clinical support. The other thing that hopefully will be um, available to you, um, and for those of you that um, access anything within um, the, within the BMA, um, we do have, and we, I can make sure that we send this as a link, but there's an area within within the BMA that kind of looks at kind of support that you might need um, and help within this area if you want to kind of talk to people about this and there's a couple of units that um, help within that. So that could be also, if you haven't got anything that's close to home that you want to um, use and have access to. Um, but support is really important and it, it, it needs to sort of develop from the, from the ground up. Um, the other thing that I was just thinking of around this is that um, for many people, um, when they're at the early stages of their um, career and beyond, they sometimes have people that they, they have as their go-to when they're on a shift. So they always have someone that they know that they're going to go to for support. Um, so it, that may well be another peer, but it may well be someone um, who they've really kind of developed a good um, working professional relationship with. Um, some people have buddies that are available that they can use as well. And the other thing that has happened as a, as a kind of growing trend, it may not be in your place of work yet, but one of the things that we've also been seeing is, do you know how sometimes you don't have somewhere where you can go to? So if you're if you're on the if you're on the ward, sometimes there's a tea trolley, like people coming to the tea trolley, but that's not really a place where necessarily you can do support. You've got the staff room that you can go to, you've got other areas, but there's you just this might need a moment where you can go away to take stock from the situation you're in, but you might not have time because the next person's there that you need to see. Um, there have been um, places within some hospitals and trust that they're just finding like there's areas that you can go to. You just say that I need to go here and they're starting to build and saying, actually, you just need a moment to take stock of what's just happened so that you're not emotionally going in from one situation where you haven't had a chance to think about it and, and debrief to the next. Not always, not always possible, but that is a, a growing trend that's happening as well. And the final area within this is, is looking at the kind of realistic optimism is that um, one of the things that's really important is that, you know, we we have to be realistic about how positive we can be in certain situations. And you're not always working in an environment which is absolutely positive. There are a number of constraints and things, but we do need to. That's one of the key parts. So you've got when you're thinking about resilience. There are kind of five, there are five key areas, like understanding how you emotionally feel, thinking about the change you've got, understanding about your own self and just thinking, well, actually, where am I, where am I in this? What support do I have available? And actually, in terms of how I feel about my optimism, how realistic is that? Am I someone who, um, I've got a glass here, but it's pretty full. So I am, you know, I am someone who is more glass full than, than, than empty, but you know what I mean? But understanding about the optimism side of you. I want to bring this up because um, actually this is really, um, hopefully you can all see it on, on the screen at the moment, but this is by um, uh, Lauren Schwartz, um, and it's looking at the power of, of, of engagement. Um, the piece of research it comes from is originally from 2005, but it um, develops from there. And it's about, interestingly, it's about energy levels, which kind of goes back to something that I was just mentioning before in that last area around our emotions and our resilience and our energy. And one, what you'll be able to see in each of the quadrants, and I think this is self-explanatory in a way, but one of the things that you can, depending on um, what's happened in the course of a day, you may well find that you actually have a range of emotions within energy levels. And that actually, depending on the people that you encounter, the situations that you have, this will vary throughout the week. But it's really useful to understand about where you have like high and low energy and who you get it from and actually how that might impact on your ability to be resilient. And then you, you yourself may actually give out both positive and negative energy as well. So one of the things that you can see, so again, I'm, I'm pointing as if it's obvious, but that you can see that each of the quadrants so for high energy positive, you can see the kind of, if you were describing yourself, these would be kind of words that would be used. And if you were sort of in this area here, which to me is the passive, relaxed, calm, peaceful, which is positive, but not super high. 
because sometimes hi 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 can actually create um an, an unmanageable ability to be resilient because you're kind of too you're too there so it's just understanding about your resilience around energy is is really interesting to have a look at and one of the things that you could do if you're working tomorrow or the next you know the, the rest of the week just having a think about do I actually have aspects throughout the day depending on what I'm doing the activities that I'm with where I'm demonstrating both high and low energy and actually are there parts of the day where I might be giving off this to other people both positively um, and negatively um, and what I thought we'd have a look at in relation to this was just to have a think about um, just with what you've got there, without reading into the subject area, without doing too much, just thinking about your own energy levels. And I guess, I suppose, if we think about it in the context of today, um, if you were to kind of give us a rough marker, I'm just going to bring up a few things around here. So if I bring each of these up, so you can see here, so in the high energy level, when you're looking at this, it's looking at kind of performance. So just when you're thinking about these words now, I've got four that are gonna come up in the screen. So there's performance at so this part, you can, you're doing it, you're getting going, you're able to perform, but you know, you're just, you're able to make that work. But actually sometimes what can happen in this other area here as we go lower down, this kind of recovery, you, you're still really positive, you just got a little bit more low energy, but you're kind of more relaxed in this area, you're in that kind of re recovery zone. And what I find from working with people is that often what can happen is that there are high levels of performance throughout the course of the day. And then at certain times there's a kind of lull where they've got to just, but actually as the course of a week unfolds or even the course of a day, we find that we can get to a point where we, we do actually feel a bit burnt out. Um, and there is a survey that you can have a look at filling in. If you sort of feel that this is where you are, um, when I send the, the link, we'll make sure that if you want to, you can have a look at completing that, which is on the BMA's website, and it's free to just get a sense of, if you are feeling that way, what you could do about that. And then the final, final areas where actually you think, I've gone beyond that, I'm actually just purely on survival mode. Um, so I'm going to bring something up now um, where I just want to get a sense within the room where you are. So I'm just going to bring up this poll now. Um, bear with me a second. Just bring it up now. So it's just asking you what zone you're in. So performance is, I'm just gonna launch it now. So there's performance, survival, burnout or recovery. And so, yeah, so performance is high. The survival is kind of quite, quite low. Burnout is, as, as it says, and recovery is um, where you're kind of, you can perform but you can recover but you're not. So I, yeah, just, yeah. I'm just waiting for you all. Thank you so much. Okay, that's brilliant. I've got a good number of people who've responded. That's brilliant, thank you. I'm just gonna close that and show you it. It's really interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it up now. Um, I'm gonna close it and I'm gonna share it with you. Why I say it's interesting, when you see it, um, so you'll see in that quadrant there, there's like a third of you that are like in it and you're performing, you're like in it and performing. So one of the things that can happen with that is that through time you've got that high energy it could be that you're excited you're happy you're energized and you really love what you're doing and one of the things that can happen if you're always on that performing 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 and you're not having a chance to just recover you've just got to give yourself that space to do so so that you just maintain a good level of resilience but there's interestingly on the flip side you look at it a third of you are in complete survival mode you're like i'm at well the scottish in me would say you're at the end of your tether which is, you know, really at that point, you're like, you're like, this is just, I don't know if this can go up, this just can't go on the way that it is. And so depending on, I mean, to me that obviously, I'm sorry that that is the case. Thank you for being so honest with it. But the survival mode is very hard because you, you it's, it's it, obviously in terms of health and well-being, some of you, it will have, have be having a detrimental effect. You will know that yourself. People might not necessarily see it, but they'll see it through time. And then, then there's 17% um, of you each on burnout and recovery. The burnout one, what can happen is we go in a cycle of this. So if I was to ask you this um, again regularly, the people who are in survival will remain roughly in survival, but you will find that people will move beyond in different areas. But it's really interesting to read a bit more. I'm just going to close that now. Um, and just hopefully that's closed now. And I'm just going to move on and hope the screen will just work for me. Yeah. 
So one of the things that I just thought I'd flag up, so this was one of the things that I'll make sure that I send you afterwards that you could, it's quite hard to see probably see on the screen but I just thought in terms of well-being and um, obviously I didn't know what how people would respond but in terms of just thinking about the kind of survival burnout aspect and um, there is some really useful things in here and in the section which is called check yourself out that's where you can find the questionnaire around thinking about burnout which has been produced which is really useful to have a look at um, and the other thing is just really around support um, it's hard to necessarily do on a on a webinar but you there does need to be different layers of kind of support from a kind of support within the organization within your team um you need to have that support where you're able to talk to each other and that's not always possible which i realize but having but having the support part is, is really key um i'm moving on just i wanted to just move on because at this point i felt like um when we look at the individual side of ourselves there is something that has a massive impact on team. And I just wanted to touch on a few things around team and just food for thought on it. Um, if you if this is an area that you'd like more on, there's some really good stuff on the on the module on understanding resilience and healthcare that's available. Um, but one of the things that I think is important about team resilience is that one of the things that we can find with it is that we might be okay within ourselves, but how the team are. And particularly, you'll know this yourself, whether you're a member of the team or whether you're managing others within the team, the mood and motivation and feeling within the team has a massive impact on, on how you deal with resilience. Um, and there's a, there's a nice case study where, um, where it looks at this really positively, which happened in Leicester, where um, there was a team that really, they just had, they'd lost contact with each other. They were so busy doing their own thing that they had just lo lost that team spirit. They weren't communicating. They were all kind of in their own silos because they just didn't have enough time for each other. I guess they kind of not fall, I don't mean to be so dramatic, but they'd fallen out of love, but they'd lost that kind of insight into each other and the attitude and behavior wasn't there. And there are a number of factors that impact on team resilience. And I've only mentioned a few here, but where people start to become curt to each other, they're forgetting, like thinking about introductions, about manners, about approach, just, you know, you, you know that campaign, hello, my name is, you know, that was, that was put together where hashtag hello, my name is, it's some, some of the things that come from that also impact on the ability to be resilient around the way that we communicate. Now it's really hard to have a team spirit if you are working um, on multiple sites where you have people who are coming in and out of roles, where you don't get to see each other regularly and you don't have that continuity within the team, which can be very hard and many of you will work like this. Um, and, and the other thing I think is that in the current climate within within medicine, I'm only talking aloud from, my, it's, it's a very hard climate at the moment to be in and people are grumpy it's the start of the year we're in the winter period it's really a hard slog and no wonder many of you are kind of in that kind of burnout survival phase but that impact on team is so key and I think sometimes one of the things that can happen with it and these are just like a few just points to think about is that you may well have multiple roles within your within teams that you're in and one of the things that can depending on the type of work that you do and the ability to have clear roles within the team can be easier than others. You know, obviously, I've just got up on the screen there something which is more procedural based, where we know, roughly speaking, within that room, if we were looking around, everyone would roughly know what the team roles were and responsibility. But in some specialties, it's not as clear cut as that, just because of the nature of the work that you're doing, and also because of the multi multidisciplinary nature of the teams that you're in. Um, and what I would just ask at the moment is that just this is the final thing to sort of think about is just it would be some of you might well be in one team, but some of you might well be in multiple teams. And I just wanted to get a kind of final sense of this. We're coming sort of this is the sort of kind of last phase of the session now. Um, but I'm just coming into this last one now, just out of interest to know. I'm just bringing it up now. Here we go. And it's just launching for you so it should come up on the screen now for you and just a sense of how many teams are you in at the moment um and this and yeah just to have a little look at that just for me to get a sense of yeah okay brilliant i'm just going to close it and share it for you so you can see 
Um, I'll bring that up now. I think you should all be able to see that now. So what you'll see here is there's a split, sort of a third and two thirds. So two thirds of you are in one team. So obviously one of the benefits of being in that one team is that in terms of thinking about about resilience and again this is just to say it doesn't mean you, you should necessarily do it but some places have started to think about um, creating team charters like thinking about within the team that I'm in actually how can I make the most of that around the around um, the concept of resilience making sure that we are clear on what the team is about so it links back into the five aspects of resilience that you're looking at personally but brings it into a team setting and so people it's being called a team charter but you can call it's just more about taking stock within the team actually what you do now that's much easier to manage when you're in one team one of the challenges that the third group have now I put three or more there, there could be that in the context of your week and whether you're in a portfolio career whether you're not you've got multiple roles that you're doing with a numerous team with numerous teams and that creates a significant level um, of difficulty because you're managing both virtually, face to face, you've got you've got a number of different things that you're putting together. And so one of the things that you could do within, so one of the things that could be healthy to do is with the teams that you're in at the moment, and it depends on how you feel about mind maps, but with the different teams that you're in, it's just thinking about are the particular ones where you actually have a good level of resilience? And is there anything within that team setting that, that is really positive around resilience and then when you're thinking about the other two or, or more or four is there things is it because it's too rushed the team never sees each other and um, it's you know there, there's, there will be something within that that will be making it harder to be resilient at times or you may well find it's fine but one of the challenges you've got when you're in the multiple teams that I'm really mindful of is trying to make sure what can I take from the what's working well in one team even if it's somewhere completely else and bring that in to that place of work and what's hard is when you're in the multiple settings, it makes it hard to think, which can be useful to just take that stock and say, what's working well within that one and why? Uh, is there anything I can take from that one and move into it? May not, but it's just to think about for the future. I'm just going to close this down now. Um, bring that up here. And then hopefully that will move on. I have to just bring it back again. Bear with me, everyone. Yeah, here we go. One of the sort of last things that I just wanted to just say is that one of the things when we're thinking about that kind of concept of performing around energy and around looking at what happens when a team is performing highly, and this is where the charter links in well, is that in high performing teams, there tends to be um, certain things that they, they have, which if you were asking them, they would be able to say, they might not use necessarily this terminology, but it would be there. And for me, there's a, there's a few things that I think are important. The, the last one, which is that practice creative conflict, you know where they say that that, that that practice and create. So one of the things that can happen is if there's a situation where there's a conflict, um, that's healthy and within the team that they're in, and also it will relate to the stage of the team that that person's working in as well. But if you're able to think about managing conflict, not really as an issue, but thinking creatively around it, like, so what can I, so this question has been brought up, this is really useful, how can I tackle it? This requires time, which you may not have, but in a high performing team, that latter one they were around practicing creative conflict. And if, again, if someone's interested in that, I'll just make a note on that. I've got something interesting on that that I'll make sure that I send um, so if anyone's interested in that part. The other one really that I think is um, useful, which some of you may use, is the RACI, where in terms of an approach, you think about who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulting, who needs to be informed. So within a team, not everyone needs to know everything. Um, and also that's not possible. But when you use the RACI model, you can start to think about techniques and, and approaches to working within the team. Um, and you can use it in a quadrant function or you can use it in a discussion function. Um, and the other one is thinking about the way, the diversity of the team as well. Just thinking about the more diverse the team makeup is in terms of um, personality, attitude, behaviours, outlooks, experiences. That also can help. But you can not always dictate that. So that's one of the other things that's interesting around this topic area. But for high performing teams, these are the main ones that kind of come into view, particularly around enhancing levels of performance and resilience. Um, and I think the other ones are quite self-explanatory, or I hope that they are. Um, the resources that I think would be useful for you to have a look at and um, beyond today. So I linked into the burnout inventory, which is the one on well-being. That's the actual link there. 
um, there's, a, there's a module on understanding resilience in healthcare, and there's also a really lovely module on emotional intelligence, which does feed into this. Um, and there's one on conflict. It might be, you know, if you like this, you might like that. There is also some really interesting research um, from the Centre for Resilience, which again, if you're interested in knowing more around the subject area, um, it's, it's based in London, um, but the resources and activity that they've looked at both look within a clinical and non-clinical setting. But I just thought is if anyone wants to do something more beyond today, straight away, these are some good places that you can go to. So we're now coming to the end of the session. Um, I just wanted to um, thank you all so much um, for your participation and enthusiasm to respond to all the polls. If this is the first time that you've done a webinar like this before, I hope that the experience has been enjoyable. Um, we do have an email address there if you if you need anything further. But what will happen next in terms of the, um, the next week ahead is that um, those of you who have attended will then receive a certificate and then I'll just send a couple of things that I think might be useful to have a look at beyond today. But thank you all so much um, and have a lovely evening. All right, take care. Thank you.